and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple. The madman beh behind behind the game that, even after 35 years, still reminds you, no elves. <laughs> the one, in, the madman behind Talislanta, which is now heading into, I believe we're at 6th edition at, at this point. 6th and final. Mm -hmm. The one and only Stephen Michael Secchi. How are you doing today, man? Good, man. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Thank you for com thank you for coming on and th and thank you for putting up with all of the weirdness that happens with that happens with technology like liking to mess with our heads. Okay, man, we we got it now. We're rolling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't they didn't hear the outtake. We're good. Yeah, technology <laughs> it likes to give us the middle finger. So. Now, I, I, even though I've been familiar with Talislanta off and on over the years, I am going to be approaching this to a, to a degree as to a, to a degree as um so, as someone less so because every much like how Stanley said every comic is someone's first, the same thing can kind of apply to role playing games to an extent. And I suppose I should start out at the humble beginnings. Um. Walk me through your introduction to role playing games itself. I know that's gonna, I know that's going to be quite a stretch. Uh, well, I, it's pretty. I remember the story pretty well for sure because mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, I've been a musician for most of my life, mm -hmm. and uh, I think this is around 1982 or something. I had a cousin, my cousin Fred from Seattle, came out, and um, he was about. I don't know, six, seven years younger than me, and he, and he was visiting for a little while, and he said, you got to try this game, Dungeons and & Dragons. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I you know, I got to go to rehearsal. I got to do this. I got to do that. I kept making excuses. And I was thinking like, well, you know, I like my cousin and everything, although he he was he was a really, really big into acid. He, he was a crazy kid, man. But I finally, you know, it was the day before he was supposed to leave, and, and he said, you know, come on, you got to try this game. I said, all right, come on. I figured out. I got like a half an hour, I'll do it. And about three hours later, I wouldn't let him stop. <laughs> I, I just thought it was so much fun. Mm -hmm. It's the first time I'd ever played, and, and literally we went on for at least three hours. I forget how long. And he, he was just doing off the top of his head some crazy stuff. And um, I started, I, I thought I might want to play it. I couldn't find anybody to play it at first. It took a little while. I finally found a couple of people, my cousin, a couple of people. And that's sort of what got me into it. And once I got into playing the game, I got into writing stuff about it. As we were talking about a little bit earlier, uh, Dungeons, early Dungeons & Dragons didn't have any setting material. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to play it, you kind of either had to run their adventures or make up your own. And I went right to make up my own. And as soon as I did that, um, uh, thankfully, I never did play uh, advanced Dungeons & Dragons because it's the worst set of rules I think I've ever seen in my life. Uh, we used a simpler version that my cousin had sort of just kind of winnowed out, winnowed out all the junk. And when I started playing it myself, I did the same sort of thing. And after doing it for a couple of years, I started writing my own my own stuff and kind of got into the business. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, started off by going down to a store in Manhattan. I'm not sure it was still there or not. It was called a Complete Strategist, and the owners were really. Uh, great the brothers danny and mike they were great guys and i just said hey if i write a book of this would you carry it in the store he said sure like it was no problem i said really he said yeah he said and I'll, and I'll give you the name of a distributor that we deal with out in pennsylvania and if he likes it he'll order it and i got two friends together we started bard games and sure enough everything that guy said that he did Mm -hmm. Bought the first, I don't know what it was, 12 copies or whatever. And then that distributor put in his first order, which I think was around 24 copies or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what got started. I do that, did that for a couple of years and did a, a series of inexpensive, like $10 books. I think the complete alchemist and stuff like that. And then we did another thing based on Atlantis. And at that point, I just 
and decided I wanted to do something really, really different. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was didn't want to do any more of uh, well with Atlantis. We actually got into non uh, European mythology. We actually did the world mythologies mm-hmm. from different continents, different cultures. But by the time I got to Talos Lent, I had become a really huge Jack Vance fan, and I just thought, you know, the, the weirder the better. I, I just want to do something that's really strange and really different. Yeah, and that's kind of what Talos Lent is. And I will, I will admit, my my introduction to Jack Vance was a bit roundabout, and it's ma- it's mainly due to Terry Pratchett picking on him. <laughs> oh, really? Um, that's kind that's kind of what that was that was kind of that that was kind of the intent of Rincewind. From Discworld, he was. Uh, I'm not. I'm not familiar with that. But anybody who picks on Jack Vance, you know, I got a problem with that. Um, <laughs> so was <some>, my boy. <laughs> well, I say pick on him, but something you have to keep in mind is the disc. The Discworld series is the equivalent of a crack fic. He a lot. A lot of a lot of the stuff within it is picking on fantasy motifs with a bit of British humor. Right. Right. And. Well, the whole the, the joke when it comes to Rincewind is that he he's a wi- he's a wizard or he's he describe it as a wizard who can't cast magic because there's one really 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 dangerous spell in his head that is so dangerous no other spell wants to share headspace with it. It uh, the spell I- is never shown, but because of the fact that he has that spell in his in his head, at least. At least, at least everybody in the universe has tried to kill him at one form or another, in one point or another, which results in his great magical skill being running away. Okay, and, th- and this is supposed to be a satire on Jack Vance. It's not a not a satire, just a just a just a dig. Because he poke at him. Yeah, poke fu- yeah. poke fun at him. That's that's why I refer to it as a cr- as a crack fic. Um, oh, it's oh, take it's, it's taking. When somebody's writing that kind of thing, they're taking motifs and just taking the piss out of them. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I became when I became a Vance fan. One of the things I like about him, first of all, is he's just a was a really, really good writer, and it's hard to read for me. It became very hard to read any other kind of fantasy because he was such a he was just such a good prose writer. Mm-hmm. But uh, there was a review of him somewhere along the line which I really liked, and the, the reviewer, who I believe was also an author. It's something along the lines of Jack Vance has more throwaway ideas, just ideas that he mentions in passing in a, in a chapter in, in one of his books than most people have in a whole book. And that's true. And that, that's what I want. I, I love that about him. Mm-hmm. Just there's so many ideas and, and so many different things. And it's just such an interesting take on stuff. And that's what I was trying to do with Talos Lanta was to do that and just to, to have cultures that were really different and unexpected, not the usual stuff that you run into. Not that there's anything wrong yeah. with running into, you know, classic fantasy stuff. I, I like Lord of the Rings a lot too. Yeah. I've, but, yeah. My policy has always been, I don't have, I don't have any beef with Tolkien or with Lord of the Rings. I have beef with I the idea that that's what is. you have to do. What we call, right. you shouldn't have to do anything when you're playing in role playing. If you ask me in, in this was one of the things I was mentioning to you. Also, this whole um, idea of what was official D and D and what wasn't, and that was a big thing. That was a big argument with the people who had, you know, created the game and people over at the company uh, that was publishing the game. And I always thought, well, who cares? You know, I don't. I, the the guy that taught me, my cousin, the way he taught me D and D, he had a party that I thought, you know, most I think most game designers or or it's kind of traditional role playing people, I guess you would say, would be aghast to find out the way he was playing the game. His his group had all the the highest possible uh, artifacts and weapons. It was plus five everything or whatever. Everything was made of mithril. Um, they killed. They had over the course of a couple of years of campaigning and killed every god and the the what was that deities and demigods or whatever that was called. Mm-hmm. You know, they they fought everyone and killed everyone. That's the way they were playing like five versions of Superman and they loved it. And I, to me, I thought, why not, man, if that's the way you like, if you're having fun, why not play the game that way? So I've never thought there was a wrong way to play it. I always thought, you know, whatever you're doing, house rules, you know, you want to mess with things, drop things out, bring people in. 
or different, you know, characters from different games and stuff. I think it's just as long as you're having fun. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, I, I never really get I never really put much thought into the whole offic the whole official thing and I and when I use the phrase that I use often which is designed by gospel um, it's mm -hmm. most it's mostly to have a dig at the, at this idea of what you're supposed to do or the bad wrong fun because when I was a little kid when I was before I even got into tabletop um, I was really I was really big into board games and re and really big into card games and every time we played wh whatever it was we would always end up inevitably house ruling when I would when I would get the yep. the old big blue box big blue um bucket of Legos. I was rarely do I was rarely doing th doing things um, according to the directions. I was always freestyling it. Sometimes I didn't have it. I didn't even have a clue of what I was doing until I finished. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think that's good. It's creative. You know, that's, that's what you should. And when you pay for a game. You should be able to play it any which way you want. And even even though even though it even though the great jazz era predated predates me, um, the idea of jazz sessions is something I find interesting. You know, you have that. You have this kind of controlled chaos where one person's playing, a, one person's playing a, playing a certain tune. Then, ev then everybody just improvises, adding onto it more and more. Nobody, there's no real, there's no real structure. There's no real sheet music that everybody's going, that anybody's doing. They're just, they're just, pl they're just playing as things go. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good comparison. Yeah. And uh, and truth be told, I think I think a jazz session is a good analogy for TTRPGs as a whole. Mm -hmm. But that but because of that, then as I get older, I see this idea of of what you're supposed to do, and I'm I'm like, I'm not not only am I not going to do that, I'm going to make fun of the people doing that. <laughs> uh, simply because yeah, I, mean, I find I really, the idea you can play ridiculous. it any way you want, but you know, I mean, even people, if you want to play it exactly by the book, that's okay too. The rebuttal you know, I've always you... had is, when's the last time you played Uno as written? <laughs> I, I, don't, I couldn't tell you the last time I played Uno. I think I only played it once. <laughs> but so many people do house rules of Uno to the point that there was an edition of Uno that had that collected a bunch of fans' house rules. Okay, that's cool. That's sort of the same thing with Monopoly, right? I mean, p people have a lot of different versions of Monopoly that they play, too. Yeah, there's... There's a but there's a bunch of different there's been a bunch of different versions some some of these special editions I don't I don't put too much stock into because it's just a reskin of Monopoly and well lipstick on a pig, but then you get the no, I, you, I mean the like the homebrew stuff you know if you go over to somebody's house they're doing something different than you did at your house yeah that yeah. that's the, that's the kind of stuff that I was doing long I was dipping into that kind of stuff long before I even um, started tabletop and I just brought that over with me. That, that's pretty much what I did with <laughs> Talos and the, the game, the games that came before that was like, take Dungeons and Dragons rules and just keep twisting them and twisting them and simplifying them. And, and uh, actually I remember seeing a, a game that I was really kind of impressed about. I think I stole one thing from that. I, think I stole an action table idea from it. Well, it was a Conan, the barbarian, the first yeah, the, that, Co that was the one that um, Zeb had made, which is reincarnated into what's known as Zephyrs or Zeb's fantasy role-playing system. Okay, did that have an action table? Do you remember? Yeah, it did. Um, yeah, it I, think, had... I think that's where I got the idea from. I thought that was. I mean, I I wrote it differently, but yeah. I, that's where the the idea came from. Just have one table that you could there always were, use. There were three games in the in the TSR days that had that action that had that action table. Um, what, what Zeb Co Zeb Conan is is one of them. I have to, I have to refer to to it as such because there's three or four different Conan games in my head, so I have to separate it. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, he was the original, the first role playing version. Anyway, the first the first standalone. There there were a couple Conan advent Conan adventures for AD and D, but those don't count. Um, right. One edition of Gamma World used it. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't the first one. It, I can't remember which number, but one of them did use the action control table, as it was called. And the big yeah, one okay. was what's known as Marvel Phase Rip, or it was just Mar or TSR Marvel or Marvel Superheroes. Okay, so they were they were all copying that guy, <clears throat> the guy Zeb, then, excuse me, <clears throat> because I think he was the first one and that put that out. There. <clears throat> 
there are already a bunch by the by the time the action control table was even a thing. There were already a few games that were using D100 um, roles as it was, so it wasn't too much yeah, of a leap. Chivalry and sorcery used. I think I think that they were the yeah. first ones using yeah. that percentage role. Yeah. Um, I think. As far as who was the first to do roll under D100, that's debatable. I'd say I the earliest like the earliest I can think of maybe. Maybe um, well the the earliest that I know of is stu is stuff like Metamorphosis Alpha and Boot and Boot Hill as far as TSR goes, but also um, RuneQuest. So it's it's really a chicken and egg sit situation. Yeah, I had I had RuneQuest I've, back back when I first started doing this. I I bought a lot of the games. I didn't have much money, but when I did, I would always buy another role playing game and just like to check out the rules and stuff, mm -hmm. or to check out the art and um. I'm trying to remember what the name is. Yeah, RuneQuest I thought was pretty okay. Chivalry and Sorcery was uh, really cool for what it was. And I got to meet the, the guy who wrote that, Scott Bazaar, one of the guys who wrote it. And man, he was the nicest cat in the world when we wanted to first start Bard Games. Uh, that was the other guy at Complete Strategist that, that they pointed me towards. They said, call, call this guy Scott Bazaar. And we were in Connecticut and he was in Long Island, New York. To call Scott, and Scott will help you out. So mm -hmm. we called him up, and I mean, there's very few people. I don't know if there's anybody like this in the business. I hope there is. But Scott said, "All right, you want to start a game company? Come on down here." And he said, "Like, come on tomorrow, or whatever the heck it was." And we went down. We spent the whole day with him in his place, and he had a he had a place where he was publishing the game. He had, it had a little game store in front, and basically we sat down with him, and, and he said, "Ask me any question you want," mm -hmm. and. We learned about the game business from Scott Bazaar that day, and you know, yeah, one of the most generous things that I that I've ever seen anybody do, who supposedly is your competitor, but you know, he was he was just great that way. Yeah, and truth be truth be told, the the whole idea of ha of hacking a, an existing game into into some into something completely new is good company. You already mentioned chivalry and sorcery, but. The the other big one I always bring up when it comes to that phenomenon is, um, how, geez, why is why is it Rollmaster? Why why did it skip me for a second? Because Rollmaster started out as a bunch of AD and D house rules and then kind of evolved into its own thing. Yeah, we all started out as AD and D house rules back then. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, in the night in the eighties, which is when I started doing this, everybody had already played D and D. That was the first thing. If you you know you had to play D and D to figure out what was going on. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we all house ruled D and D is the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. You know. Um. I did, I did. Truth be told, I didn't house rule D D and D per se back th back then as as much as I house ruled um, rifts. Yeah, but I mean game designers. <laughs> yeah. You know that we're we're all coming out. That's that's the first thing. That's you know. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the game that came out of the primordial ooze, you know. There was no role playing until those guys came up with that. So yeah. we all, yeah. particularly those of us who started, and I started. I, I don't remember when D. Do you got the year when D and D actually first came out? Do you remember that? Uh, seventy four. Was it that? Far? Wow. Okay. So it didn't even reach the East Coast until like eighty or so, or seventy nine or eight. Oh, I guess it was seventy nine. Then seventy nine ish was when. When AD and D first edition came out. Okay, so I did not have the first edition, the old staple books. I had I, when I the first thing I bought was a, a hardcover with ghastly art on it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So what year would yeah. that have? That would would have been what eighty or so? Maybe. Prob prob probably probably because because there's like f there's like four or five different versions of first edition D and D. Um, it's hard, it's hard for me to nail it. It's hard for me to nail it down. I mean, you've got Beck me, you've got BX, yeah. you've got the different editing passes, um, you've got white box, you've got you have the blue version as as I've called it. Right, but this was the first the first hard covers. Mm -hmm. That's right when I when I the first stuff I bought. That's what it was. Yeah. And at yeah. by that point, there were already a couple of imitators. I don't even say imitators, but people who also made their own role playing games. Mm -hmm. Chivalry and sorcery being one of them. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, not too many other ones. Then over the next few years, while I had we had Bard games from I think it was eighty three to eighty eight, eighty nine, didn't last that long. 
Mm-hmm. There's a bunch of other games that started coming out. Uh, Cyberpunk. Mm-hmm. Jeroen, which I always, I mean, I, that was, I was so crazy about the art for that game. I wasn't crazy about the game, but I thought that was the best art I, I'd ever yeah. seen in a role-playing game. Mm-hmm. That guy was crabby, though, man. Yeah. But <laughs> I, uh, met him at, I met him at a Gen Con in, in 86. He was so crabby. I was like, come on, man. <laughs> and everybody has their bad days. Uh, I think he was just, he was mad at us because we, we had uh, a, uh, what do you call it? Like a scavenger hunt thing that we're, you know, that we've printed up a little thing we're handing out. And we actually gave away a 24 karat gold, um, a 20 karat gold, I think it was, miniature of the <laughs> Tamerlan character from the Tiles Atlantic game. We gave that away, but you had to like follow around and follow all these clues. And we just put a fake clue in there about his booth in the Jeroen game. It not not specifically. It was like it was kind of like semi clever, you know, mentioning a character from the character type from his game. And a couple of people went over there and they came back to me and said, well, "Oh, he was like really mad. He and he <laughs> he was cranky that we went over." I said, "You should have laughed about it." Well, it was no big deal. Nobody was making fun of him. I, I loved the game, but yeah, yeah, you you know, you meet a lot of different kind of people in the business. Mm-hmm. Mostly really good, particularly early on. And that's what I was talking about, Scott Bizarre. Scott Scott used to say, you know, if you see me at a game convention, just follow me around. All I do is walk around and, and steal things off of other people's tables. <laughs> and then I just say to him, come over to my table if you want something. And I said, mm-hmm. you know, that was the way the game, the business used to be run, which was a lot more informal and very friendly. Yeah. A lot of fun. So you meant you mentioned Jack Van- you mentioned Jack Vance's work as one of the big inspirations with Talislanta as well as the desire to not d- to do fantasy but not in th- not in the um expected manner were there any yeah. other authors or me- or media that what that would be in that hypothetical appendix n as it were yeah um um i really liked uh the, the travels of marco polo and i i wanted to make a that's the way I wanted to introduce world setting to people. I said, let me put like a Marco Polo type character. And then he doesn't know what's going on. So everywhere he goes, he sort of explains what he learned. And that was the, the first uh, setting book for Talos Lanta was called The Chronicles of Talos Lanta. Mm-hmm. I had not heard, believe it or not, I had not heard of The Chronicles of Narnia at the time. That's how unfamiliar yeah. I was with uh, fancy literature. Mm-hmm. So I called it, I called it that. And, Emerlin was sort of the guide, the the guy who wrote about everything in Talisman. Yeah, but that was a big yeah. that was a big thing. Uh, there were a few other ones too, and I can't. I'm trying to remember offhand. Uh, the Elric books I really liked a lot when they first came out. Mm-hmm. Till I read Jack Vance. Yeah. Um, uh, Lord Dunsany of all, you know, you, are you familiar with that guy? I think I've heard the I think I've heard the name a couple times. But it's, oh, it's he was, either he was a really like classical kind of a writer, but he wrote fantasy and it was really interesting stuff. Um, I'm trying to remember off a couple of other ones too, but those are those are the main ones. And Vance being the main inspiration, just in terms of like, you know, be adventurous, mm-hmm. you know, as, as a writer, be bold and adventurous and try different things. So yeah, we def- I definitely got that from that. And uh, also, mm-hmm. the other thing I wanted to do was not not put any white people in my game so there weren't there weren't any white people in Taos Lanta originally I think except even Tamerlan was sort of brown but I I, I was really kind of uh, put off by how how non-multicultural uh, Which, western fantasy was at that early in the early going I look you know, at that D&D. as I look at that as a consequence of everybody thinking that in order to be fantasy you've got to be cribbing notes from east from not even eastern Europe western Europe um, in particular, yeah. the British, the British Isles region of Euro- of Europe, which... right, and in, in, in Germany, and, and, and yeah, all, it, I just thought it was, you know, it's it's fine for what it is, but mm. I really wanted to do something different. I, I started doing it with Ad- Atlantis, with the African cultures and Asian cultures, mm-hmm. and then by the time I got to Talos Lanta, it was just alien cultures, you know, yeah, just, let's, yeah. yeah, not and, to not be like that. Oh, uh, I do, I do recall that. Um, in the in the nineties, you ended you ended up working with Wizards of the Coast. Um, how talk? How did you first meet up with Tweet, who oddly enough has been on this show in the past? Uh, I never actually met Jonathan Tweet, but um, I, how did I meet? I think I met. Let me see. How did this hit really happen? 
I think I was contacted by Lisa Stevens. Um, what had happened was Bard Games had had actually done pretty well to start with. We got killed off by a, a massive order from the book trade. We were, besides Dungeons and Dragons, early on, we were the only company that was in any bookstore. Mm -hmm. And that just happened by a fluke. A friend of mine, his girlfriend, happened to work at Walden Books, which is not even around anymore, but it was like a border books type of, of yeah. Of Walden Books was one of the was one of like three or four bookstores that was in one area where I used to live, and because of how much of a massive bookworm I was, I would I would um I would jump between bookstores and just and just read. Yep. It's their fault for making yeah. comfy couch for comfy seats for me to read in. Because <laughs> well, they were they were the first chain bookstore that bought uh, the early bar game stuff, which actually sold really well. Even like even by today small game standards they were selling like 5,000 copies mm -hmm. which was not bad and particularly for now I guess as I hear not too bad at all um, but uh, we got killed by a uh, that the buyer at Walden moved on or was fired or something they brought a new guy in and he wanted to up the order times five or ten and mm -hmm. I it sounded that sounds like really good news right you know, like, hey, instead of giving us 500, give us 5,000 or whatever the heck it was. It wasn't quite that bad, but it was pretty bad. It was like, yeah, instead of giving us 500, I think he said, give us 2,500 of anything new you have. And I said to him, are you sure that's a big order? And he said, yeah, I know, but but I think we can do it. And I said, you sure? He said, yeah. And they couldn't. Mm -hmm. And in the book trade back then, they had returns on everything. Yeah. So we had geared up to print a lot of stuff, to print more books, to make more books. And then we got massive returns and it, it basically killed off the company. We barely, mm -hmm. barely made it out, barely paid off my friend who was the investor and got out. And at that point, I think I was either contacted by Lisa Stevens or, or Peter Atkinson. Um, they were just starting off and they wanted, they had heard, either heard about Taos Lanter or seen the ads for it or whatever. And we worked out a deal. Um, mm -hmm. where they, they licensed it for a few years. Mm -hmm. And the, that was the, the third edition. Yeah. And the part of the, part of the reason that I, that um, I bring that kind of stuff up or the, t or the time when it was under the stewardship of Morgan press is it's, those are, those are two instances where, so, where somebody involved with Talis Lanta has been, uh, has been on this, sh has been on this um, humble little show in, mm -hmm. in the past. Um, so it's it's really it's really a case of um small world yeah well especially in our in our business early on it was really a small world <laughs> before the hasbros got into it yeah and, and before wizards you know came out with magic mm -hmm. and where talus lanta was the last thing i think that they did besides they had a primal primal something or i forget what it's called that was their own title but that was pretty much the last thing he did before Magic. And Alice Lanta, as Peter had told me for a while, was the only thing that kept the lights on. And it wasn't doing a good job of keeping the lights on. It was just barely keeping them. Yeah. Oh. And of course. And, and with the now with that with that in mind, something that I do find it I do find interest I do find interesting that was done through was done on first through fourth, and I'm cur I'm curious if this is something you'd you'd be you'd be considering for the for the next version is it w is um character creation was mostly pre gens, which right. which, by the, yeah. which by the time you by the time you got to the eighties that was that wasn't as much of a th of a thing in the in the role playing scene. Every, everybody was starting was starting to use um. Use full on character, full on, not necessarily freeform, but full on character creation as right. kind of the standard. Pre gens were the kind of thing that would get would get relegated to say modules or starter sets. Yep. Uh, what? I'm not sure, but I, I think we uh, we might we might have been the first people to use archetypes. I'm not sure, but I, I can tell you why we did it in. 
I know what you're what you're saying is that you, by the time it got to Morgan, which by the way, the fifth edition I didn't have anything to do with at all. Mm-hmm. It was just a licensing deal. I'd, on the other editions, I was sort of uh, had creative control over them to some extent or to a large extent. Uh, fifth edition Morgan, they I just said go ahead because I I was busy writing music and producing, and I got all this, all this other stuff going on. When I was contacted by Scott, he asked him to license it. I said, yeah, go ahead. You know, made a little contract and he did it. But um, yeah, the archetypes, it, it, this goes back to what I was thinking of, I, I was talking about a little bit earlier with you, maybe before we, we really started the show. It's a game game design. The concept of game design is, um, and you know, a lot of people have different versions of it. And for me, the thought was always like, you know, I, I didn't want any complexity in the rules because the milieu was so complicated. I don't mean complicated, like difficult to grasp, but there's just a ton of stuff in here. Um, have you ever looked through any of the, the setting books for Talos Lanta? Have you ever had a chance to, to do that? I have. I have. Okay, so you kind of know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I've, there's like I've gone th- I've gone through plenty of of games that of games that lean simple on the mechanics and du- and double down on the um, setting. Um, yeah. I, I recently this is like that, and and then some. I mean, this yeah. is this is like o- almost to me, it's almost all setting, and as a result, I just thought there there needs to be as little impediment a new player and a new game master saying hey let's try this game and them actually being able to play it mm-hmm. so anything involving character creation i just said don't need it yeah and in fact i really felt it was an impediment and also it's an impediment because how do you create characters a milieu you don't understand you know what i mean a lot of taos lantern character types and cultures are very um i don't want to say narrow but they have their ways and there's the certain things that they do and there's certain things they won't do, whether it's because of their beliefs or they can't do just because of their own, their own physical limitations or mental or emotional limitations or preferences. Mm-hmm. So unlike in a game with a uh, standard or uh, classic type fancy characters, you can take an elf and uh, I'll call him anything I want. Let me call him Bob. You know, I don't care. Uh, let me give him this skill. Let me give him that skill. You can, you just sort of can create a uh, custom character those tend to not work at all in talos lanta yeah it's just no there's no you know standard template there hey take start with this template and then add on anything you want to it it's just kind of not playing the game then you know you're you're creating a character from another world which you can do you can always bring D characters into talos lanta and that kind of thing but again part of the game concept for me the design concept was sim- very much simplicity on the front end and let that complexity and detail happen mm-hmm. and mill you in. Yeah, and with the with the upcoming sixth edition, is that is that particular pre-gen um, approach still still going to be in play, or is it or is it getting tweaked? Yes, uh, yeah, I'm 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 really uninfluenced by anything that's happening around me. I don't really care what what's modern or what isn't. And what's actually funny is it, uh, um, Chris Patarlis of everything epic games mm-hmm. who's the publisher on this and, and my partner on this has uh, been telling you why well, all, all the, the uh, old games are coming back the old black and white games you know and I, I said well that's good they're coming back as black and white and we're taking an old game and it's finally going to be in color so yeah i don't really care mm-hmm. game is is what it is and you're going to like it or you're not and you know you can of course welcome to customize it and do anything you want to it but concept wise in terms of the game design that yeah that's it's going to stay pretty much the same if anything i tried to make it a little bit simpler and that was hard for me to do too i've just i've been out of this for a long time you know this, I, I did one thing with um i don't know if you so did you see Talos lance of savage land by any chance I mean, not many people did but i did i did okay so yeah i did that with the late uh stuart wick who's a really wonderful guy mm-hmm and um, that's kind of like Talos Lanta Light. I tried to make it, okay, this is the prehistory of Talos Lanta, and how do I make, can I make a version of it that's simpler and still, like, interesting to me? That's what Savage Land was uh, going to try to be. If anything, this, uh, ep- what we call the Epic Edition, which is the last one I'm ever doing, mm-hmm. um, 
it's got everything that we ever put in it. And not rule wise, but creatures, characters from from other. We did a, a book. Um, I shouldn't say we did. The company Shooting Iron did mm -hmm. the fourth edition, which I'm really fond of. Uh, they did a book, Midnight Realm, which was basically kind of like denizens of the lower planes associated with Talos Lantern mythology. And so we've got some of that in here too. And we've got a little bit of Savage Land in here, some of the character types and things from Savage Land. Yeah. So we're kind of just trying to get everything stuffed into these three really, really big books. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we got it. We got, we got, everything's laid out now in rough terms. We have to kind of just yeah. polish it up a little bit. Now, I'd like to ask a bit about one thing that can spark a lot of arguments whenever it comes to deal whenever it comes to dealing with fantasy settings. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about magic. <laughs> okay. Um, when it came to the magic system that was developed and refined with Talos Lanta, was it a case where you had the idea down pat very early on, or was it a case where there was a lot of um, arguing and back and forth about how magic was going to work for Talos Lanta? Uh, there was never any arguing because I was the only one writing it. <laughs> so, I don't usually argue with myself. But, um, well, I should hope so. Otherwise, that's the first sign of madness. <laughs> yeah, you know, been close, I guess, a few times. But no. Uh, again, I tried to keep it simple in the first two editions. It's really simple. There's very few spells. But there's um, a, a history of... The Talos Lanta in the current setting, so-called current setting, was the New Age when it was first begun. And there was a prior age when the, the magicians really knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And they were really powerful. And then there was a huge disaster, which they probably caused. And a lot of this stuff was lost sort of like the Dark Ages. And that's kind of the idea of the, the premise for the... Um, so it's essentially shifting from a, from a Dark Ages into a Renaissance. Right, into the very beginnings of a renaissance where people are finally rediscovering how to do certain things. And so you always had this big backlog of stuff you could use or you could make up anything you wanted to as a game master. You know, if you wanted to introduce, hey, somebody found a spell book from before the Great Disaster. Well, oh, my God, let's go crazy. You know, and those spells would be more advanced. So we, we did it, I did it that way. And we started filling in the blanks later on with, in, at, uh, in, during the third edition um, they wanted more, the Wizards of the Coast people wanted more spell list type stuff. So we did things like that. Mm -hmm. We also did a, a book uh, for them that had a lot of the ancient lore of Talos Lanta that tell you who some of the, uh, you know, renowned ma magicians, sorcerers were of that age, the kind of things they, they wrote, the kind of spells they did. And just give you a whole bunch of adventure scenes for people to possibly add to their own campaign. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's in this epic edition too. Yeah, brought that yeah. back. And when it comes to when it comes to windship, windships yeah. and the and the rules for them, um, that's one that's one particular av any sort of ship combat is one particular thing that I can easily see getting a bit crunchy. How did yeah. how did you manage to dodge that particular problem? I think we dodged it at first by not even dealing with it. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember if there were any much rule much in the way of rules for windships. I mean, I suppose there was something in there. In this edition, we, we kind of added a little bit more to it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not, you, you know, you can get, you, uh, the, the word crunchy is a good, good way of putting it, but, you know, I mean, you can make, uh, it's a lot harder to write simple rules than it is to write complicated rules. Mm -hmm. Because complicated rules, and I see this with game designers who, you know, maybe are just, I don't know if they're just learning their trade or they don't care whether it's complicated or not. They keep adding exceptions for this. You, you know, well, here's what you do. It's always this, except unless that happens or unless this happens and unless that happens. And if the wind's blowing this way and you've, you've seen original D&D &D rules and you've, you've seen uh, miniature war game rules, right? Mm -hmm. But you know what I'm talking about. Miniature yeah. war game rules, they literally take the humidity into account when it comes to archers yeah that yeah, a lot of there's nothing wrong with that there's man. nothing there's wrong, nothing with, wrong that. with that the the um the the approach that i that i've taken as far as why that became a thing has to deal with the crowds that were in the that were in the first generation of that 
middle ground between war gaming and role playing games, sure. in the sense that a, yeah. a lot of them were a lot of them were co were um college history buff crowd kind of people, and yes. putting in all of those de all those details was it was seen as vet was seen as vastly important. Plus, let's not forget oh. that the early war games traced their origins to the to the war, to the officer training war games for, in Eastern Europe. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and for miniature war games, I and mean, that stuff is is very valid, in, depending on how, uh, quote-unquote, realistic you want your game to be. Mm -hmm. And it, it matters what kind of, you know, armor people are, are wearing them if they're in the middle of somebody trying to stab them. It, it matters, and in, in, you could say in a fantasy, in any kind of fantasy game too, but the question is, how do you deal with it? And to deal with it in the way that early so-called advanced Dungeons & Dragons did, was you know what they had that stupid thing uh, there was to hit, uh, there was, to hit armor class zero or yeah Thaco, which, right somebody, somebody yep. reminded me of that the other yeah day. it was, was like, oh, it was God, Thaco and my my attitude with Thaco has always been it was an all right idea that was explained poorly it's ghastly it's actually ghastly if you've if you ever tried to play anything like those rules and you had a fight between, you know, five, God forbid, five goblins and four of your members of your party. It, it could go on for 45 minutes, you know, if, if they happen to be wearing different armor mm -hmm. and, and carrying different weapons. It was, it was silly. So, now, what, what, I mean, what got silly? Way, it's fine if you like that. You know what I mean? I, I'm not trying to even criticize mm -hmm. that. I'm just saying, you know, if that's the kind of game system you want, it's great. I just didn't want to do that. I wanted to, to have, if you have a fight, I want it to happen and be as fast moving as possible yeah. and as free form in the sense of, that's the other thing that's written into the Talislanta rule is that you, you always state your intent. Mm -hmm. What are you trying to do? You know, yeah. and, and that gives you the chance to add a lot of detail. Well, I'm going to jump up on this, you know, test of drawers and then I'm going to jump onto the stairs and then I'm going to swing across on a chandelier. You can do all that stuff in Talislanta and a game master can handle it really simply by just figuring out how hard is that to do mm -hmm. basically on a scale of one to 10, What's the degree of difficulty and adding a penalty? And it might be one to 20 or something like that. But I think everybody gets that sort of simple. That's the simplest way I thought of dealing with stuff like that. Just, you know, make it a little easy. Or I should say as simple and easy as possible, as fast to play as possible. And it's mm -hmm. exciting. It is exciting when you got a good game master and you can have, a, a you know, a, a scene with multiple characters and all kinds of action going on and, Every kind of thing you can imagine happen. People slipping and falling, and all this other crazy stuff. It's fun, you know, and mm. it doesn't take forty-five minutes to play one little encounter. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, uh, personally, what I always found more ridiculous when in during that era wasn't necessarily Thaco, but um, stuff like weapon speed, which mm. I think it's very telling that that didn't stick around as the years went on. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, so somebody's probably still playing that somewhere, but yeah, and that's fine if they like it. But yeah, the that's kind of what I'm getting at the 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 line that we often use is "It's a free country, and you are free to be wrong." <laughs> <laughs> that sounds one way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, but given given the emphasis on on archetypes, um, there's a there are there are a few that I'd like that I'd like to dip into. I'd like to dip into. Simply because it's mm -hmm. it's going into things that I've um, spent a lot spent a lot of time arguing about in one form or another. Okay. One of the, since one of the examples on the game found page is the um, Simurian sword mages. I know I screwed up pronunciation, but no, you got it exactly right. All right, it's Simurian. Yeah, you got it. The Obviously, the name Sword Mage is going to conjure up the idea of somebody who's good, who's good at using a, good at using a sword or good at using martial combat as well mm -hmm. as, as well as magic, even if that magic is in a combat sense. A lot of games try to do a lot of games try to do it. Usually, it ends up being a giant kit bash. If you'll forgive me for referencing my um, pl my plastic model days, <laughs> but when it comes when it comes to the, when it comes to the idea of somebody who's able to do magic and sword and sword play equally, um, what's the, what's the philosophy that you have with it? Just set, just handle it with skills, or do you have a different idea in mind on how to interpret that concept? 
Um, I'm not sure if this is, this will answer your question. So, so if not, I mean, but I, my perspective is it's is almost similar to the Dungeons and Dragons thing. It's kind of like a dual class, but in Talos and I th I think in Dungeons and Dragons I don't remember, but you know you only earn a certain amount of experience points for the things that you do, mm -hmm. and if I'm a warrior, I can use all those experience points to improve myself as a warrior. If I'm a magician, I can do the same. But if you're trying to do two things, it's twice as hard to get better at them. So I always felt that that alone kind of made those characters just fine to me. I didn't think they were too powerful and I didn't think there was a problem with it. I thought it was very simple uh, for the cultures that had that kind of thing. Not every culture in Talislanta has that. Uh, where people can study magic and also study some form of, you know, uh, combat. Mm -hmm. um, similarly in sword, mage is probably not a real good sword, swordsman, swordswoman, you know? They're they're better than people who don't know that skill or who don't have those two skills. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's kind of the, the kind of the way we handle it. We kept it, we kept it simple, like as much as possible. And I don't know if that answered your question though, did it? Yeah, I I was more. It's this is more of a philosophy question because for me a bit for me a big reason why even even something like dual class doesn't doesn't qu doesn't quite fulfill the for lack of a better term class fantasy is because mm -hmm. I feel I feel like when I when I hear the image of a sort of a sword mage it's it's not some it's somebody who's who's utilizing who's utilizing both of those elements in a way that a pure swordsman or a pure mage won't. Um, and yeah, because they don't have the dual capabilities, right? Yeah, and they don't have the training. Dual cl dual classes always. The reason why I made the analogy of kit bashing because is that's what dual classes very often ended up feeling like to me. Just two, just two, just two clashes bashed together, but not a whole lot of synchronicity between those between those two um, styles. Right, and and I think some some of the D and D dual class things that they don't seem to go together. I think in Talos Lanta, it doesn't happen that often. Although there is, a, you actually can do a customization in in some senses as you develop your character. You can, mm -hmm. if you want to, try to learn magic, which not every not every character type can, but it's it's a, a grueling you know, time intensive type of a process, but you can do it. Um, for the cultures that have that, there's very few of them. There's Simril, there's another one, Zandu, I think. And um, there are a couple of warrior priest type characters, mm -hmm. but that's part of their culture. You know, they have, they have fighting priests or cleric, and we don't use the word cleric, but, uh, or they have magicians that also had to serve in military. They serve a real purpose to have somebody that can swing a sword. Also, mm -hmm. also we never had the art, what I thought were artificial constraints on what kind of weapons characters could use, which I always thought it was like pretty ridiculous that a D and early D and D. I don't know if it's true now, but they could only use, wizards could only use daggers. You know, like that's very arbitrary. But okay, there's and still that, we there's never still, had that. There's still that to an to an extent. Especially, yeah. especially with the rise of um, we never did that. We never did it. I just figure if you're if you're strong enough to use, I mean, some of these medieval-ish type era weapons, you have to be pretty strong to use, you know. But if you had the strength to use it, why not? And we didn't even make we didn't really like make try not to make things very restrictive. Yeah, you know, I think people have more fun. Most people have more fun with games that have a little flexibility. Also, because the cultures in some ways are rigid enough, you know, you can pick a Talos Lantern culture like a, a thrall, and you're never, you can't learn magic. You just can't wrap your head around it. Yeah, but you're a great warriors. They're all great warriors. And as, like that. As far as that whole, oh, wizards can't, wizards can't use, um, wizards can't use daggers. That's that that goes right into that whole, um, are you a are you a setting or are you are you a setting or are you not? Because well, for and even even if I were to just limit it to just the source material everybody knows about, you have get you have Gandalf having bo having both a staff and, and a sword thr yeah, throughout yeah. throughout Lord of the Rings. So, and I know I know he's at the top end of ca of casters in that setting, but that's but just be, but being at the top end is not is not an excuse, and. 
then I, then he I swung can... a sword pretty good too. You know, I mean, yeah, if, and... if, if you get in there, he's in the, he's in a few battle scenes where he's swinging a sword pretty nice. And then <laughs> then I consider um then I consider magic users outside outside of outside of the typical like like say. A, like say a lot of um, Chinese exorcists will use a will use a wooden sword as part as part of their exorcism practices, or mm -hmm. da, or um or da, or Taoist priests that ha that tend to have a jian, which it basically a chi basically a Chinese straight sword, or mm -hmm. you ha or there's the there's plenty there's plenty of instances of the whole enchanted the whole enchanted arrows thing throughout various mythos. And it's, if if um if some if someone were to say okay wi okay wizards can't wear armor because armor ends up interfering with their ability to communicate with their power source, all right fine I'm I'm willing to work with that. If you say they can't wear armor because because they can't wear armor, then the eyebrow starts raising. Yeah, uh, that's kind of what I'm. That's kind of what I mean. It, it, again, it's it is all arbitrary. But the nice thing about fantasy is you can create characters that you know can do things that people really can't do, and can't do things that you would think they should do, be able to do. Yeah. You know, as, as long as you have some sort of slight internal logic as to why they wouldn't do that or can't do that. Yeah. That you're trying to, and as long as you're not creating again a system of rules that has. Uh, prohibitions that are really obvious to the players like uh okay I, well i can't do that because of what game balance or something you know which by the way i've never been really that concerned about i, I, I don't know to my approach with game problem. balance has been has been it's has been um yeah good. it's good for you so long so long <laughs> as so long as you don't have pl as long as you don't have players step um stepping on each other's toes it's not it's not gonna be that big of a deal Right. Um, you know, when we first started doing this edition, and I was talking to Chris about this, uh, and we we originally had planned to put some uh, 5e conversions in the mm -hmm. book, then that, that whole OGL thing fell through, that, that whole mess. Yeah. That caused us to yeah. pull everything. Thankfully, I'm, I'm actually really glad it happened. At first, I wasn't really glad it happened because we had spent a good deal of our uh, time and resources hiring people to help us do 5e conversions of Talos Lantic characters, which was pretty interesting. We were going to do it as a dual system book. We did not because of that problem. But we had many, not many, several discussions with Chris and other people who were 5e people. And they, one of the things that they were telling me was like, well, you can't have a character that, that in 5e that doesn't do X, Y, and Z. Or You know what I'm saying? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not saying it well, but there, there, Talos Lanta is just not like that. Talos Lanta, there's a lot of character types in that. They're meant to be supporting characters. I mean, you can play them if you want to, but good luck playing some of these characters. They're not heroic. You could try to make them heroic, but they're really in, were added to the game to be NPCs, more likely, to be characters you're interacting with, extras in a scene, in a sense, supporting characters, but not the heroes of everything. Mm -hmm. And the impression that I was given, for, you know, in this last go around here with the five E stuff, is that every five E character has to be—you have to be able to be a hero, or to be a character class, or whatever the term they use. And then I had a couple of good arguments with Chris mm -hmm. about this because I was like, "No, there's just characters in in Alice Land that you can't do that with." I walk around with it. We have a character called a Bodor musician. They're musicians. They're not fighters. They're not even bards. He kept arguing this could be a bard. I'm like, "Nope, it's not a bard." So, no, you know, again, it's fancy. You can do whatever you want to do. What if, if game balance is something you're really worried about? Did that, you know, I never did. I think whatever balance there is in Talos Lanta, and I've run a couple of, um, I haven't run any campaigns in a long time. I haven't played in a real long time. But the first five, six years of playing Talos Lanta, um, I didn't really have problems where any one type was, was taken over a game, if you know what I mean. Mm hmm. It, the different personalities, the, uh, the different cultures, and the different abilities—they all work together the way you you kind of would if in real life. Weirdly enough, in real life, with people who have different abilities, you know, you're better at this, you do that. I'm better at this, I'll do this. Mm -hmm. it worked out pretty well. Yeah, and like I guess 
my 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 overall approach when it comes to game balance has always been, I guess I, I guess I can describe it as complicated. It's never it's okay. never been a there's is I don't want to believe in one size fits all ap approaches when it comes to design and same thing applies when it comes to game balance. If somebody asked me my ideal game balance, I would say it depends on what you're trying to do. Oh. You're right. Exactly. Now, I know that there's a lot of archetypes within 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 the coming within the coming epic edition, but over a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. So this might be a hard <laughs> question to ask, but what archetypes have always been kind of standouts or, or ones that you that you really liked over the years? Um, I have a few favorites, and some mm -hmm. of them are 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 favorites also of, of a lot of people who play the game, and some aren't. Um, I don't know how familiar you, you are with it, but or, or if anybody listening to the show is familiar with Tales of Atlantis, it's sort of a, a niche kind of a game. Um, but there, there are a few cultures, uh, and, I, and I, I like quite a few of them. There's, there's a ca characters they call them uh, Nagra that that are spirit trackers, which I thought was an interesting concept. They could track anybody by this by spirits, and they have a weird relationship with the spirit world. Mm -hmm. um, they wear uh, these wooden vials around their neck that they believe contains a, a part of their soul. It's called a spirit jar it's to protect them from being possessed by their enemies. Uh, a tribe of witch men who also live in the same vicinity. I like those kind of guys. Uh, we had another group called the Aryan, and the Aryan are, um, I hate to say it, but they look like, you know, people always say, oh, they look like black elves. I said, oh, yeah, they're, well, okay, but they look that way, but they're a really, un I think, a kind of an interesting culture that um, mm -hmm. they have a really different outlook on on time and reincarnation and things that they're going through their current carnation reincarnations uh that they don't want to they're neutral about a lot of things that other people get tense about on the other hand every once in a while if they have to deal with somebody who's a you know who, who's a problem they will kill that person which they they view as sort of like well they, they're helping him move on to his next incarnation so mm -hmm. but, you know and it's something that i get a lot of those kind of weird little funny things from jack vance Whose characters many times were portraying themselves as a certain way, and they were that way, but they always had they had some kind of quirk, something that, that was quirky about them. Mm -hmm. so I like those characters. I like the thralls, which are just the basically the warrior types. They were created by the sorcerers back in the old days when they used. To, and then the sorcerers from the old days were just pretty bad. They were kind of like, I guess, what like we would be if we suddenly woke up tomorrow with magical powers, and you know, what would you do with them? You can imagine the range of things you and your friends would do if you had were able to cast spells. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what the early Talos Lanterns, who were called Archaeans, were like, and they created other uh, hybrid peoples to do their dirty work, to fight for them. Be their concubines. I mean, they were pretty decadent, pretty messed up people, most of them. Mm -hmm. And the thralls are like, kind of like leftovers from that period. And they were basically made to all look alike. They weren't even supposed to have personalities. They're, they're all kind of clones, basically, although we don't, we don't use that word. We don't use scientific terms in a fancy setting like this. Mm -hmm. But they, over the course of hundreds of years, have kind of created their own culture about it. It's a warrior culture. And a lot of it has to do with the way they tattoo their bodies, and so no true, no two thralls ever look exactly alike because of the tattoos. They look exactly alike, except for that, and except for uh, gender differences. But I like that kind of thing. I like the way that you know, there's cultures that have evolved and that have a history, and it's to me kind of interesting. It's not, it's not like a generic elf or a generic dwarf or whatever. Mm -hmm. They have weird histories. They have strange and interesting cultures to me. It's one last one I would say is a, um, a character type called a Zambrian wizard hunter. They were also created back in the old days, or their forerunners were, um, and they were created to to basically uh, hunt wizards. Wizards were sending these like wizard hunters, their magic resistant wizard hunters, against each other to settle their arguments. Mm -hmm. That's really how it started, and they end up at the end of the great disaster, kind of being disenfranchised with nothing else to do uh, and end up because they don't have, this is really complicated. Well, not complicated, but it, you know, involved. 
because they don't have souls, they end up being inhabited by the souls of this, this one people who were wiped out by the absolute worst sorcerers of that era, called the Torquar. Mm -hmm. And they are basically are what they're doing now is going after the, the if kind of this, whatever life they may have had has, has been dead is now dedicated to try to getting the souls back of these people who lost their souls. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're still wizard hunters, but now they hunt the basically the reincarnations of these Torquar. Yeah. Now, there's weird storylines like that. You can play a character and suddenly you have this giant history behind you that I think was, mm -hmm. is kind of cool. And if you're not really interested and you can play it really simply, hey, I'm a thrall. I'm just, I like to beat things up. You know, I like this stuff. I'm a mm -hmm. good guy. I'm a tough guy. I fight. So you can get deep into some of these characters or you can play them just on a surface, sort of like, let me get in there and swing a sword around and, mm -hmm. you know, whack guys around. Um, those, are some of, those are some of my favorites, though. Yeah, and I, I can certainly get that. Oh. Uh, now, as I under, as I understand it, the there the crowdfund for this is split into is split into multiple books. The first one the first one being the player's guide, then the Atlas and GM's guide, and then the bestiary of Tal of Talislanta. Oh. Now, as far as the There's also a five E book yeah. that uh, will will have IV uh, conversions on all the monsters and all the character types. Mm -hmm. uh, now, with the with each of those books, what would you what would you say would be the page count for each? Do you see most of them stick sticking around 200, 200, 200 to to um two fifty pages each? Um, no, <laughs> the atlas is gigantic. I I'm trying to remember if it's 400 pages or not. It might be over 400. We're, uh, the bestiary, I think, is the smallest one at about 180 or so. I think Player's Guide is more like what you said, 250 or 300. Mm -hmm. I could actually check if I wasn't so lazy. Hang on one sec. Let me see. We have we do have things laid out in semi-accurate form. Let me just take a look. So... Mm -hmm. Bestiary is what is this? Let's see. Page through this. Currently, 167 pages. Probably going to be a few more pages than player's guide. Probably should have had all this information on hand, huh, man? Mm -hmm. uh, 243. So it'll come in. Or yeah, 248, 250, something like that. And the list. Is gigantic. Where are we? 397, and we're not, I think we're about done. Yeah, it's going to come in at about 400 pages. I, I, was, I was exaggerating a little bit. Mm -hmm. A lot of pages. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then, and all, and all of them with indexes. Yeah, though, actually, index is not so bad. That's that's easy to do, but everything else is, is, is hard. And it, it also was. Uh, difficult because this was sort of you know really feeling like you know man I'm not doing this again this is it I wasn't even going to do this I, I, I think you know I just stopped doing this some years ago and I just gave away everything in PDF form yeah you if, put if everything in um, Creative Commons uh, yeah if, if anybody would like to see Talislanta books and not want to pay for them just go to talislanta.com and look at the menu where it says uh, Talislanta for free Every single book except Savage Land is there for free download PDF and hopefully always will be. That's my my intention, anyways. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, I got kind of diverted by that idea. I wanted to say that to people mm -hmm. who were saying, "Gee, yeah. I'd like to try Talos Land, but I don't want to pay anything." But there you go. Yeah, that's how you start. But I will certainly be looking forward to seeing to seeing um, Talos Lanta reach its fruition. And it does it does warm me that that um to see to to see um it, to see it come back in the in this form because I've I've sung praises for on Talislanta many, many times over the years. Um, oh, thank you. So it's so and it's well it's well it's a case of full circle for for me in what in one form or another now that I'm doing that now that I'm doing this show. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. <laughs> I and I appreciate you having me, brother. Thank you for doing so. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I'll, I'll keep that in mind for next time. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!